Focusing on meat as the key to greenhouse gas emissions and climate change is misguided. I did a recent video before going into detail, but now we've got two studies that really kind of help round this out and emphasize this point even more. I'm Dr. Brett Scher, the medical director at dietdoctor.com. And look, climate change is a big deal. We've been seeing so many different environmental disasters that could certainly be linked to climate change. And the temperature of climate is going up and climate change scientists really believe strongly that we have about eight to 10 years to make an impact where we might be past the point of no return. It's pretty depressing. I have to be honest, I don't know how good the data is to support that, but it's very concerning to hear. But even more concerning though, is when I see, when I see people really focusing on what I think are the, are the wrong uh, solutions, you know, focusing on something that's convenient for themselves, that doesn't impact themselves, that they think is going to have a major impact. And a big part of that is meat, the push against meat. And now um, two studies have recently been released showing, well, maybe we should be focusing our attention elsewhere. And here's, here's why. Now, one thing I learned from looking at these studies is environmental impact studies are complicated. So many different models. I mean, you really have to, you can't really um, measure it over so long of a time, you have to come up with some conceptualized models, which makes it challenging. But let's talk about these two studies. So one uh, published in the Lancet Planetary Health, greenhouse gas emissions, water footprint, and ecological footprint of food purchases according to their degree of processing in Brazilian metropolitan areas, a time series study from 1987 to 2018. Basically what they found was taking uh, samples over time that the percentage of greenhouse gas emissions has increased the most in the highly processed food category and has actually decreased in the lower processed food category. Now, the overall contribution was still higher in the lower processed food, but the rate of rise was much more significant in the highly processed food. Now, the way they did the study was really interesting. They took, they had little subset analyses of what people were buying basically, um, what kind of food they were buying in Brazil um, at, between 1987 and 1988, and then again in 95 and 96, and then again in 2002, 2003, then again in 08 and 09, and then again 17 and 18. And they could compare the data over time. And what they found was overall, the greenhouse gas emissions per calorie consumed was increasing significantly, increasing 21% over that time frame. But when you break it down according to the degree of processed foods based on the NOVA characteristic, and that's G1 for unprocessed or minimally processed, G2 for processed culinary ingredients, G3 for processed foods, and G4 for ultra processed foods, okay? And what they found was that greenhouse gas emissions from G2 foods decreased by 18%, whereas from the G4, the ultra process increased by 245%. Now they also measured water footprint. I've got a big problem with how they measured water footprint, um, but same trend, decreased by 17% for G2, increased by 233% for G4. And then an overall ecological footprint, same type of pattern, decreased by 13% for G2, increased by 49% for G3, and 183% by G4. Now, the method section in this paper is a, it, it, I guess it's a, a class on how to try and quantify and measure these things, which is very difficult. But a couple important points. They include carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride. So often we just hear carbon dioxide, methane, and that's it. But they really in included um, the broader category of greenhouse gas emissions because they all contribute to, to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to um, measure all of them if you really want to be accurate. They also tried to measure a water footprint. Now, they used a, a total water consumption, which includes the sum of the surface water or groundwater, which is the blue water, the rainwater, which is the green water, and the water needed to assimilate the pollution load of the production system and conduction or the gray water. Now, that's really different. If you're just using natural rainfall, that's very different than having to use gray water or having to use even blue water. Um, so I don't really like combining those. And that makes a big difference when you're talking about uh, uh, especially cattle and beef raised on 
uh, grass raised in their natural environment using mostly rainwater. Um, that's a huge difference because what is that taking away from? That's really not taking away from anything. So I don't see that as a negative that should be included in the water footprint. So I have a little problem with that. But they, they were tried to really be um, specific about what they were measuring and especially about the ecological footprint overall. Now, the way they calculated things, beef still had pretty much the highest uh, in overall contribution, but it was steady. Right? It was steady, and that's, that's a big part of the concept of, of looking at livestock um, and their contribution to climate change because the number of um, methane-emitting livestock have not really changed over decades and centuries. And I did a podcast with uh, Professor Frank Mitlerner who, who went over the science on this. That hasn't changed, um, and I think that shows in that the the contribution has been kind of steady in this study, but it was those ultra processed foods that went up. And that's a thought, that's something that we don't really think too much about, right? Because it's not, you know, the food products aren't emitting methane, but it's what it takes to harvest the materials for the food products, what it takes to put them together in the factories and the fossil fuel use and the transportation. And, you know, it, there's so many other concepts involved and other inputs involved beyond just the, the animals or the growing of the crops that we have to consider if we're talking about a food's footprint. And that's what I really like about this study, how they looked at that. And they showed that the ultra processed food is where it's rising the most. So if you wanted to stem the rise, then you should probably look at what's been rising the most and ask yourself, is there a beneficial impact that these foods have that maybe we should be protecting or looking out from? And aside from lining the pocketbooks of a bunch of companies and stockholders, I, I can't think of many because it's actually likely contributing to worse health outcomes. It doesn't, you know, most of these ultra processed foods aren't supplying nutrients or, or protein or things that we need. They're just supplying calories. Um, and now we can see at the cost of increased greenhouse gas emissions. Now, the second paper was published in the journal Sustainability, and it's titled Lifetime Climate Impacts of Diet Transitions, a Novel Climate Change Accounting Perspective. So this was a study out of New Zealand, where basically what they wanted to do is compare what the way people are eating now versus the way if they followed the New Zealand dietary guidelines versus if they followed the guidelines in a completely meat-free diet what kind of impact that would have on climate change. And this was interesting, again, because you have to look at carbon or carbon dioxide and methane specifically because they have different impacts. And that's, I'll, I'll sort of cut to the chase on this one. And what they found was if you went meat-free, certainly did decrease um, the climate change impact, but short term. And then over time, the impact was much less because methane is a much shorter lived gas compared to carbon dioxide, which lasts basically forever. So the, if you went completely meat free, their conclusion was your impact would be a reduction in two to 4% of your greenhouse gas emissions and in, in your contribution to climate change. Just two to 4% by going completely meat free. And that's what I think really shows the focus on methane is misguided and the focus should be on carbon dioxide and fossil fuels. One, because that's where the majority of the greenhouse gases come from, but two, that's the one that's gonna stick around forever. And that's the one that if we don't stop polluting now, it's gonna be there forever. Whereas methane, you, it's, always, it's gonna go away in a much shorter time period. And you can have a short-term effect, but the long-term effect is going to be with carbon dioxide. But some of the other interesting things they did in this paper was first they just looked at contribution to greenhouse gases. Then they looked at it per protein source. And that's so important because we know that if you're going to get your protein from non-animal sources, one, it's a lower quality protein, so you're going to need to eat more of it to get the equivalent effect. And two, it comes with more calories and more carbohydrates. So it's a less efficient source of protein. So they're definitely not equal. doesn't mean you can't get your, pro your adequate protein um, by not eating meat. Of course you can, but it, it takes more calories um, and it's going to take more inputs for those calories and more greenhouse gas emissions associated with those calories. So you have to factor that in as well. So the impact when you look at it per protein was much less than if you just look at it in general. And again, it's a short-term effect that doesn't sustain as well long-term. So for me, that was the take home for the second study that, that sure, you can make, a, make an impact and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by going meat-free, but it's short-term impact that doesn't 
stay consistent long term. If you want that, you have to target the fossil fuels and the carbon dioxide. So, so I think this ties in well with my previous video about sort of environmental concerns of meat and greenhouse gas concerns in general. And the focus really needs to be on fossil fuels and carbon dioxide, which isn't convenient for the people who have the loudest microphones right now. But what is convenient for them is to say no meat because that's their, their personal bias, which is really unfortunate because as this study showed, it's going to have minimal, minimal long-term impact. But instead, if we could focus on the fossil fuels, that's where you're gonna get your maximal long-term impact. So it sort of brings up again, so the, the, like the hypocrisy of the situation. And I, I'm, I remarked on this years ago at the, I think it was the Golden Globes at this point, where the, you know, they went meat free um, at the Golden Globes to protect the environment. Well, how did people get to the Golden Globes? Well, they flew their private planes and they all took their limousines with one person per limousine. And oh, by the way, they flew in flowers from South America and from different countries. And, and the food they did serve was also flown in from different countries, the ingredients to make it very, um, uh, eclectic and, and high end. And so did going meat free actually impact anything in that situation? Of course not, because there's so many other um, more important greenhouse gas emissions that were out of control, but they went meat free. So it's, it's a bit of virtue signaling, unfortunately, and a, and a bit of just trying to fit this narrative. And I used that example from a few years ago, but the, you know, there are so many examples from recent, even the COP26 conference was very similar. Um, in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions it took for people to get there. Um, but anyway, that that's my rant where our focus is, is sort of misguided. Now, if you don't want to eat meat, don't eat meat. That's fine. If you want to eat meat and you can focus on cattle that's been raised on grass for their entire life, especially in a way that can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, that's wonderful. But if you can't, then make your mark elsewhere, right? If you want to eat meat and you can't afford to eat um, meat that hasn't been, you know, done an industrialized livestock type, make your mark elsewhere, make it somewhere where it's more impactful and more important, reduce your use of fossil fuels and your contribution of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. I think this will probably be the end for our environmental post for a little while and we'll get back to nutrition and health. Um, but it's just so important that I, I can't ignore it because um, society health, environmental health does impact our health. All right, take care, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you next time here on Diet Doctor News on YouTube. Thank you.